Okay, so welcome to the final session of the Antinatalist Advocacy Advocacy Conference 2023. Um, I'm joined by Magnus Vinding. Now, um, I'm sure many people are familiar with uh, Magnus's work. I'm going to give a quick introduction uh, to Magnus, and then we are going to go into a conversation. So this session will be slightly different from other ones. Um, this will be uh, a conversation uh, rather than a presentation, as it were. So um, so Magnus has written uh, books such as uh, Effective Altruism, How Can We uh, Best Help Others, Suffering Focused Ethics, uh, Defense and Implications, which is uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, um, and Reasoned Politics. So a, a wide variety of topics. Um, Magnus has also, also written a wide variety of essays, which I'm sure uh, many people in the audience will be familiar with, um, especially essays such as The Speciesism of Leaving Nature Alone uh, and The Theoretical Case for Wildlife Antinatalism. Um, Magnus also in... Uh, we will hope to get to some at the end um but yeah i think uh without further ado we can um get into it so uh the first thing i want to say is uh thank you for coming magnus and i'll start off with the question simply what is uh suffering focused ethics <clears throat> right so suffering focused ethics that's simply a label it's an umbrella term for um ethical views that give special importance to the reduction of suffering. And um, of course, so, so that includes, for example, purely consequentialist views, such as negative utilitarianism, but it can also include non-consequentialist views that give uh, great importance to the reduction of suffering. Um, and of course, special importance, giving special importance to suffering, <clears throat> that's not in itself super precise, but one can like, uh, outline, you could say, sort of a, a continuum of views that are more or less suffering focused. But like the the way the term is is commonly used, uh, it 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 refers to views that give quite strong uh, priority mm. to the reduction of suffering. Mm. So what um what's the distinction between theoretical and practical questions in ethics when it comes to reducing suffering specifically? Right. So one way to, to describe this, like in broad terms, is that um, like so the theoretical questions relate to like include questions such as like what would be best or morally right to do in the ideal case, right? In, in the ideal kind of thought experiment, what should one do there? And then the practical questions, in contrast, concern like what would be best or morally right to do in our non-ideal world so so um yeah so what would be the, the best way to reduce suffering given the kinds of constraints that that we are facing and you could say like um other people or agents who don't necessarily share our views and who aren't necessarily um willing to to maybe even consider them in in the first place um, and i think uh one reason i think this is a, a very important distinction is that, um, yeah, it, it, it matters a lot uh, to how we um, to how we think and and how we we approach the, um, the 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 questions that we're facing and what kind of kind of advocacy we are doing and and one particular way in which it's it's relevant is that um, yeah well without this distinction in mind we might be strongly focused on well, we have the, a great theoretical argument. So what's the best thing to do is obviously just to, to go out and make this, this argument for the kind of, of moral view that we find to be obviously um, most reasonable. And yeah, I should also say that when it comes to these theoretical questions, um, I myself tend to be 
I mean, it's it's fair to say that I myself can roughly be characterized as a negative utilitarian. Um, and I suspect that's true of at least uh, quite a number of, of antinatalists. Um, so at that level, I don't necessarily have such strong theoretical agreements um, with, with at least those antinatalists who share that view. But when it comes to, to practical questions, <clears throat> I might have um, yeah, a rather different view, such as, for example, when it comes to whether um, whether advocating for antinatalism is mm. among the very best things we can do uh, to reduce suffering. And, and that's something that I, uh, yeah, have, have my doubts about for a variety of reasons, which isn't to say that there isn't uh, an important place for, for making those arguments. Um, but another thing I, I want to stress with respect to this um, distinction is that, yeah, I think a key term here is what's sometimes been referred to as the illusion of control. So this idea that, um, or th this phenomenon where we humans, unfortunately, we often have a tendency to overestimate what we can control. Uh, that's not to say that we can't also make the opposite mistake of underestimating how much of an impact we can have. I think that's actually also very, very common. But um, I think the illusion of control becomes very relevant when it comes to, for example, that we we might have some kind of idealized scenario, and it, which could, for example, be um, yeah voluntary human extinction, and to then maybe overestimate the degree to which we can make that happen if if we uh, just work hard enough and do um do the very best we can right uh, towards that end and um yeah and so in, in general as a, as a general remark with respect to to the the, the practical question of w what's best to do in practice if for example um we think our overriding or main aim is to reduce suffering um i think it's it's extremely important when thinking about that practical question to not I mean, to, to sort of visualize a very broad space of possible actions or priorities that we could be taking there. And I think it's very important not to yeah, simply prematurely collapse um, our, our focus and our priorities into one tiny narrow space and to mm. say, okay, this is the answer. Let's, let's move forward with that. Um, because I think, I mean, this is also what... Um, yeah, psychologist uh, Daniel Kahneman, he, he has said that he thinks possibly the, the biggest bias for humans when we make decisions is the availability heuristic, which is basically that we tend to <clears throat> go with whatever kind of idea, uh, if, if, we are, if we have a decision that we're facing, um, or it can also be just when we're asked about a certain question where we don't know the answer and have to estimate, we often go with whatever seems most salient or whatever is just available in uh, in our working memory <clears throat> as opposed to taking a step back and looking at, at a fuller space of like um, possible answers that, that, that we could give to the question and i think that is this is fairly relevant in the context of uh, antinatalism where um, or, or rather like the general question of how we can best reduce suffering and how that relates to antinatalism where <clears throat> it can sort of be the the maybe super salient answer that we can zoom in on and thereby potentially, and I'm just saying at least potentially raising as a question, neglecting a, a wider landscape of yeah, priorities or, or actions or ideas that might uh, also at the very least also be worth prioritizing and which might indeed, if we take um, into consideration what, what other people are working on and prioritizing, which might overall actually be like more uh, pressing or worth prioritizing, given, for example, how, how neglected these ideas might be. Um, and I know I'm sort of going into a bit of a monologue here, but but uh, there were a, a few points that I... Uh, I, I no, want go to, for it. Yeah, thanks. To, to make in, in, in relation to this, um, a related point is that, yeah, when it comes to the practical questions, unlike like in, in, in sharp contrast to the theoretical case where we can just make 
um, an argument for a given ethical view. We don't we don't necessarily have to think about um, the style in which we present it. Right, that um, isn't necessarily uh, so important if we're just discussing purely uh, ideas. But but in the practical case. Um, or I mean to say, if we're discussing ideas in some kind of uh, ivory tower, right? Um, um, but yeah, in, in, in the practical case where we are interacting with, with a wider world, I think it's very important to keep in mind that uh, there is the risk that one can make things worse, unfortunately, right? That uh, there are various backfire risks that we have to be concerned about. <clears throat> and which are, and yeah, that, that is possible to push people away rather than to, to draw them towards us, right? And I think this kind of, that this is a possibility can maybe often feel quite remote when you look out at a world that's just absolutely horrific, right? We just saw Oscar give his presentation and showed already just a few images of, of like just the horrors that are taking place every single day um, on our on our planet, right? And it's just uh, completely um, unspeakable, the suffering that's taking place, right? So that kind of state of things can obviously give us like a strong sense of urgency, right? We have to, to do something and it can only get better from here. But then... Uh, Unfortunately, I mean, in one sense, it's a very understandable sentiment, but unfortunately, it is possible to to push people away, to to alienate people, right? So, and that that highlights the need to be. In fact, this relates to, I guess, the um the panel that that <laughs> were just before this session, right? Mm -hmm. This the need to be um, or at least I think that was an important part of what they were discussing, right? The, the need to be uh, reasonably inviting, and you know, have, I think Amanda emphasized this, uh, a certain level of kindness, while of course also being being honest and being willing to be assertive about the important ideas that one has. I don't think these are need to be uh, in conflict, but but mm. I do think it's it's really worth, um, yeah, thinking about how, how one can avoid this. I mean, arguably it's already become like the standard image, at least in some circles, unfortunately, that uh, like antinatalists are just, I mean, it's a bit like vegans, right? I mean, it, we can be a very stigmatized group. Um, and yeah, I guess that can just uh, have compounding effects when, when you add many, many of these ideas, right? Um, and I think it's, it's worth thinking about how one, uh, I mean, some stigma will probably always, or not necessarily always, but be, it's, it's to be expected. Um, but but yeah, there, I think it's worth thinking about how one can how one can reduce that within the bounds of of, of honest uh, mm. conversation. Um, and yeah, like, and, and also like another point related to the practical issues is um, like just the the importance of of being aware of, of our biases. And the potential for us to be biased, right? Um, I noticed, um, like the, the panel before me discussed this thing about uh, infighting and how that can be conflicts. And I think in many cases this kind of stuff can happen because we are, uh, yeah, maybe sometimes secretly competitive without us necessarily knowing about it, right? We can have various hidden motives. Um, we can want to elevate our own status, even if we're not so conscious about it, that can be a strong motive and that can often lead to, to conflicts, right? And that people can compete to be the best do-gooder, the most admired do-gooder. Um, and anyways, but that's just one kind of bias, right? And another is to be to be overconfident. And um, and I think overconfidence relates very strongly to this, this broader landscape and this tendency to narrow down on like a specific area or specific uh, priority. Um, <clears throat> um, without necessarily having given a lot of thought to, to other aspects, right? Um, overconfidence doesn't always feel like overconfidence. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily feel like overconfidence when one says, oh, this, this rest of the landscape that I haven't explored so much, that doesn't feel so important, doesn't, it can't be that important to, to explore. 
Um, but yeah, and I think, uh, and this is really not pointing fingers at anyone, right? I think this is uh, like of universal importance and value to be to be aware of uh, our own biases, right? And really to to point our fingers at ourselves mm. <laughs> um, uh, about this. Um, and then I sort of I think one of the final points, one of the yeah, a point that I maybe got a bit inspired to to talk about by having watched both the the presentation given by David Pierce and also later by Mati yesterday, is that I think um, both those presentations were, I think, in their own ways, uh, fairly optimistic in some sense, uh, though in different ways. But um, so uh, they are both, you can say, in some sense, uh, well, obviously, they both have theoretical and practical elements. And um, their disagreement is not necessarily so strong at the theoretical level, whereas it is, there's more of a divergence, you could say, in, in, in their answer to the practical question, um, the practical ethical moral question. Um, but I think what actually they both have in common, what unites them is that they are in some sense both um, examples of like what one might call like a best case focus or a focus on, on best case outcomes. Uh, in David's case, a focus on eradicating suffering via biotechnology. And in, in Mati's case, it's uh, the idea of, of voluntary human extinction, right? Uh, which of course, um, one can agree with at a theoretical level without necessarily being a, a practical, uh, a main practical focus, right? And, and I myself would also think that that would be a better outcome, uh, volunteer human extinction, right? Than, than any uh, realistic uh, alternative. Um, I mean, of course, there's there can be some complications there with respect to, for example, wild animals. But if like if we set that aside um, for the moment, um, but but the thing I wanted to say about a focus on on best case outcomes is that, um, yeah, I think it's worth at least um, considering the, the question of whether it might actually, or, or to consider the possibility that the best way to reduce the most suffering and expectation might be by focusing on the prevention of, of worst case outcomes, um, rather than focusing on, on the very best case. Um, and so again, I, I raise this as, as something to to um, to at least consider, and which I think, in addition, that there are uh, a number of of good arguments for it that, for example, have been presented in. So, like my colleague Tobias Bauman at the Center for Reducing Suffering, he last year published a book that's uh, called "Avoiding the Worst: How to Avoid a Moral Catastrophe," mm. and it's also available for free here on on YouTube, where people can uh, yeah li listen to it as an audiobook. And um, yeah, so anyways, he there explores both the case for a focus on reducing uh, the risk of worst case outcomes and also um, like some of the practical aspects of how we, we might go about doing this, which of course is like uh, an, an uncertain question. And it's also early stage in terms of like the research on, on this issue. Um, and, and one thing that I think is important to say about this thing about a, a having a focus on worst case outcomes, or at the very least, not to exclude that from, um, you could say, what's what's on our radar. Um, yeah, one, one thing to say about it is that, admittedly, it might not be so uh, appealing or satisfying of a focus. Uh, because, for example, we might have this urge to, like, we want to find the, the solution. We want to... To, to simply end suffering, but that we might have such an urge, which of course I very much share very deeply, um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily, in, in practice, that is necessarily the, the best thing to focus on, that it could be that uh, the better thing might be to, and again, it, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, right? But, but to at least also have a very, um, a strong focus on on the avoidance of of worst case outcomes 
And what's also important to stress about that, and I think that's probably um, the final point I want to make in this uh, rather long rant, is that the, the, the case for focusing on worst case outcomes, um, or at least giving great importance to that, is not actually, it doesn't rest on the claim that it's unrealistic to bring about best case uh, scenarios, right? Um, because for example, you could think that there's like roughly 1% or even like 5% probability that you could create this kind of best case scenario of um, doing something whereby humans deliberately uh, face out suffering or yeah, um, our own existence, for example. But even if there is that probability, that could at the same time also, given that we are in, in a state of uncertainty, <clears throat> be a like similar probability that of, of, of a worst case outcome where um, of, of a future where we create far more suffering than uh, even exists on, on Earth today. <clears throat> and so, and given that this is where the, the argument maybe becomes a bit more uh, technical and I'm happy to also share some, some links that elaborate mm. further on this, but, but like the point is that the counterfactual impact that one can have on, on the worst case outcomes and expectation would, would be so vast, right? So maybe like a rough analogy I might give is something like, um, and, and again, this is like very rough, but like something like with 80% probability, you could prevent someone from having their leg broken versus with like, say, uh, shall we say even like a 1% probability you could end factory farm, right? So even though the latter is, is very, it's a very uncertain bet, it still seems overall like the right thing to do just given how consequential, um, yeah, the, the latter one would be if, if, if it succeeds or even if you, I mean, of course, in the real world, it wouldn't be so binary as a like either or, but a matter of like with our individual actions, right? We would sort of on the margin change different probabilities, right? And the point there is that from like a, a more or less sort of quote standard scenario, um, increasing the probability of like a, a, a best case outcome um, would com compared to the worst case outcome, um, like reducing the probability of, of a worst case outcome would have, would, yeah, an expectation have far greater expected impact given that there would be so much more suffering involved. Mm. I don't think I, I really explained that so well. And of course it relates to or rests on uh, this like a general um, expected value framework, which just to clarify, uh, and I excuse that this is getting a bit long winded and technical, but just that, um, yeah, an important clarification there is that one doesn't have to be like a pure utility utilitarian or even a pure consequentialist to think that it, it makes sense to at least be uh, somewhat guided by these mm. considerations about uh, expected value. But so anyways, that was a long rant, but I think uh, I, I said some of the main things I yeah. wanted to say there. No, thank you for all of that. And there's a few things I want to touch on, but before we get to um, certain aspects of that, I want to zoom a bit um, back out and talk I've got sort of two questions more about the theoretical side of things. Um, so the first one was, um, so you were saying suffering focused ethics is sort of, you know, it's a broad umbrella term for ethical frameworks that, you know, really sort of prioritize um, or put, uh, you know, an emphasis of value on, on suffering and reducing that, um, you know, for, for many people, when, when we talk about suffering, they understand that to be an experience. You know, suffering is something we we experience as a sentient being. But there are also um, other sort of um, forms of harm or other uh, things people see as bad that may not fall into the category of an experience of suffering. So one example of that is anti-frustrationism. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you could just give a brief sort of outline as to what anti-frustrationism is to the people watching and how something like anti-frustrationism could fit into um, a suffering-focused ethics framework. 
Right. So anti-frustrationism is a view that <clears throat> was defended back in the 1990s by a German philosopher named Christoph Fege. Um, and what it basically says is that, um, well, it's a view of, of value that says that, um, that essentially says that the, the best outcome we can have is one in which there, there are no pre preference frustrations. Um, so in that sense, it's a, it's a view from which you can very naturally derive antinatalism. So in some sense, it almost falls directly out of it, at least if you're looking at a single life in, in isolation. Um, and of course, that is then somewhat different because the, the view is, is, um, it's an ideal preference view. So it's not, um, it's not focused purely on just experiences and experiential well-being, but also takes into account preferences about, you know, things that don't necessarily relate to experiences. Mm. If you have a certain preference about how things are out, out in the world. Um, but of course, that kind of view is not necessarily um, incompatible with with a focus on experiential suffering as well because you can say that experiencing suffering is is arguably also a form of preference frustration and you could even go further and say that's it's arguably like the, the strongest kind of preference frustration is to experience extreme suffering right so these kind of experience based versus preference based views mm -hmm. they are different in some important ways but they also have a, like a considerable overlap you can say mm -hmm. And the other, um, the other sort of theoretical question I had before we get on to more sort of practical ones is um, there's this, I mean, you'll be more plugged into, you know, communities that talk about population ethics than I am. But my understanding is that there's a divide in the discussion on population ethics uh, that is sometimes referred to as Narvison's dictum. So it's a divide between whether you know, if we have a certain amount of energy um, to uh, do good in the world, should we be putting that into making people happy who already exist? Or should we be putting that effort into um, creating new people who will be happy? Um, or is there a sort of moral difference between those two things? W what's your sort of take on this question? And is there a particular angle that a suffering focused ethics can come at it from? Well, yeah, so... Uh, particular angle um, well in fact yeah I mean I guess one angle would be that which which is one that I myself um, endorse is basically to say that uh, pleasure simply can't or, or even other purported goods can't outweigh suffering especially not extreme suffering right so and from that kind of view of uh, of well-being I mean you can talk about both experiential well-being and and other purported forms of well-being um yeah like from that kind of view it would um, follow that there is really no there's no moral importance in bringing about happy people and it's also it cannot be morally justified to spend resources on that if it comes at the opportunity cost of you know failing to reduce extreme suffering right so that to my mind is um, yeah, I mean, many people frame population ethics as this very difficult, tricky field, whereas mm -hmm. in my view, certainly in the theoretical case, it's actually not particularly tricky. Like it's uh, to, to simply have, and even there are many views that give um, this, like that basically give this kind of asymmetric answer that I would agree with, right? So the theory you mentioned defended by Fege about answering answer so frustrationism would be one example but there's also just the view that in terms of experiential well-being that pain and pleasure are not morally symmetric that you can't treat pleasure as uh, negative pain hmm. so i wanted to get into more practical things now and one of them um i had lined up anyway but you actually mentioned it in your um in your answer to my second question which was uh when you were referring to the panel that happened just before our session um about certain um behaviors or norms that would be good to encourage in a community that is seeking to reduce suffering um 
and I know, so leading up to this, um, I listened to an interview or discussion you did on, I, I believe it was the Clearer Thinking podcast about uh, reasoned politics. Um, I forget when it was recorded, so it may be uh, from a while ago. Um, but I wanted to ask you what norms, whether they're social or otherwise, you think would be beneficial to establish in the antinatalist community with a view of individuals in that community and groups um, making more effective decisions in, in what they focus on in their advocacy? Yeah, I mean, so obviously this is a very big topic um, and there is there's a lot that one could say about it. Um, mm. I do write a bit about this in chapter four, I believe, in recent politics, although that's like in the context of politics. But if I had to emphasize one or mention one in particular, I would probably say that this is like both a norm socially, but also something to have maybe awareness of in the personal case, but like this key difference between whether one is trying to appear good and like look really good and like someone who's a morally good person versus actually being effective in terms of reducing suffering, right? And this sounds very trivial, but I think it's actually anything but trivial to, hmm. to see these kinds of drives in ourselves. Um, and, and to create a community that's strongly focused on the effectiveness aspect, right? Because this thing about appearance, it doesn't just work at the individual level, right? There can also be the appearance of wanting to make one's community look good, for example, this kind of, um, yeah, concern for one might frame it in terms of like collective status. Um, and also, I mean, quite quite related to that. So maybe I allow myself to make like a, a separate point there is that, um, yeah, so sometimes we can, there can be this strong pressure to, to do things that sound great to the in-group, right? And which might gain us a lot of status in the in-group. A good example of this, I mean, we can also here talk about, um, for example, the, the vegan community, right? You mm. can often see people who might say things that, um, at least I can think of many examples of this, where, where you do something that's perhaps a very dramatic act and it makes you look very good to your in-group, the kind of group that you maybe most want to impress and you most want to have like standing and recognition in their eyes. But there's the question of whether whether the thing that you're doing necessarily is the thing that, that, that you're doing that successfully gains your status in the community is necessarily what actually is most helpful in the bigger mm. perspective, right? Because those two things are not necessarily convergent. But, and of course, this is where like social incentives can also become helpful, right? Because if you then have a community that is generally very focused on effectiveness, then you can also, you can push the individual incentives in that direction, right? You can, if, if you manage to get to a point where the thing that gains your status or recognition in your community is in fact what is fairly effective in terms of helping out there in the real world which granted there's always going to be substantial uncertainty about what that is mm. but um but at least to have an eye for that is i think very very helpful mm. yeah no i i agree um and i think it it sort of encourages self-reflection because i think we actually all fall victim to that in in some ways it's it's not you know maybe there are specific individual individuals that fall more afoul of that um but you know there's the old saying of like if you point one finger at someone else you've got you know three or if you include your thumb four pointing back at you um so yeah i think that's a good thing to always keep in mind um when it comes to um effectiveness and advocacy if you know, let, well, you know, many of the people watching will be antinatalists themselves, and they may feel um, a, they may have a sort of, um, uh, the word is escaping me now, but they may be very driven to do a form of advocacy that 
leads to a reduction in the amount of beings coming into existence, right? That may just be something they very personally resonate with. Um, if that is the case and they want to do advocacy around that, what are your opinion what's your opinion on which group of beings they should focus that on um because you know uh, you know with antinatalist advocacy we we've sort of identified you know you've got humans domesticated animals wild animals and then there is the possibility of you know future beings who you know may potentially exist in the future such as uh you know a form of digital sentience or artificial sentience however you want to refer to it what group do you get the feeling for at the moment is the one that someone like that should prioritize their advocacy towards? Yeah, I mean, um, so first of all, I mean, I guess as a general matter, I think it makes a lot of sense not to exclude anyone, right? And to be, mostly it probably makes sense to be fairly general when you can, at least, at least Again, if you're making an argument like at the theoretical level, you honestly obviously don't want to make it exclusive there. Then, of course, you could say in the practical case, might it sometimes be more important to focus on some beings rather than others? And I think that can certainly be the case. Um, yeah, at, at least sometimes. Um, and then, of course, there can be arguments back and forth um, about different groups. So one simple factor and obviously very important one is to look at um to look at both numbers and also to look at quality of life right so for example and both of these um parameters or factors um would lead you to look at farmed animals are more numerous than, than humans although of course there's a complication because that's it's because of the humans that they exist um, additionally, and perhaps, um, yeah, I mean, additionally, you have wild animals, which, as Oscar Horta mentioned, are much more numerous than farmed animals, even if you're just counting vertebrates, um, where fish are extremely numerous. But in addition, I mean, you would have to practically, basically ignore invertebrates in order to say that that farmed animals, even if you're just focusing on land animals, to say that farmed animals uh, could dominate in terms of uh, where, there, where there's no suffering. Um, so, I mean, and, and I've also, I've written an essay that's called, uh, I think, 10 biases against prioritizing wild animal suffering, um, where I, I do think that there is a huge blind spot in the the animal movement when it comes to animals in the wild. And I think there are a number of, of reasons for that. So one is that we often have what some have referred to as a dyadic morality, where there is a like basically a perpetrator and a victim. And that when there is that thing going on, that really it uh, sort of fires up our our moral emotions and our moral cognition. So there we really get ex exercised about that and, mm -hmm. and something has to be done, which of course is, is true. But the, the flip side of that is that we can then neglect instances of suffering where there is no obvious perpetrator. But for the beings who suffer, it might be just as bad or worse. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is, a, this is a big bias when it comes to... Um, to what's happening in, in nature. Another bias there is also just pure momentum, right? So um, like when it comes to the animal movement, it's focused so strongly historically on farmed animals. So this idea that one should also focus on wild animals, um, yeah, it, it, it might seem a bit far out to many people because they haven't really come across it. So it, it must, must be fringe and crazy, right? Um, so, but, but anyways, I think there are, there are good reasons to, especially considering the, in, in the current animal movement, just how neglected wild animals are. Um, I think there are strong reasons to, uh, or, or at least it's, yeah, it's, it's at the very least worth considering whether that might actually be where one can make uh, the bigger difference if one is mm. to prioritize between them. Um, and a bit relatedly, I think I heard a couple of times that something like, antinatalism for wild animals was referred to as as an extreme position and i think maybe in some ways if you if you're talking about what's perhaps 
uh, outside outside of the, um, the public discussion or the so-called Overton window, then I might agree. But actually, if you look at the, the, the quality of life, right, of, of animals in the wild, and you look at just the, um, yeah, both the, the birth rates and also mm -hmm. how common premature death is, you can actually say in some sense, there's a sense in which antinatalism for wild animals is like maybe the least extreme antinatalist position you can hold, right? It's a very minimal position that you don't even have to be remotely close to, you don't even have to be suffering focused, I would argue, in order mm. to, to hold that. Um, but yeah, of course, so now we touched on um, these kind of like three broad groups of existing beings, right? And then there's the concern about um, like the risk of creating artificial beings, right? And I think there, there are a few qualifications that are, that are worth making, right? Because a lot of people will, like David Pierce, for example, will, will be very skeptical of the, at least of the idea of digital sentience in particular. But what I think is very important to stress is that um, artificial, uh, artificial sentience is not, um, need not be digital sentience, right? So you can say, just make a general argument that whatever processes are happening in our brains that are responsible for mediating suffering, uh, it seems plausible that that can, at least in principle, be um, recreated in ways that are not, uh, you could say, biological, or it's not a form of biology as we know it. So I think the mere, even if one is perfectly confident that, that uh, digital sentience is impossible, and, and I agree with, with David Pierce that we, at the very least, have reason to be skeptical of that, um, I don't think, unfortunately, that that means that we can ignore the risk of artificial sentience, um, especially when we think about the fact that, um, yeah, that, that humans over the last hundred years or so have created this extremely horrific institution of factory farming, right, and, and modern day slaughterhouses. Um, yeah, so, so what's in fact, I think, very instructive in this regard is to look at there were a couple of philosophers in um, back in the 1800s who both wrote about um, this. Uh, they they both wrote basically that from from the point where they were, things could only get better. Mm. And it's important to then keep in mind they wrote that in an age before factory farming even existed. Right? They were so sure that things couldn't possibly get worse. But in fact, the first factory farm was still, I guess, several decades away from, from even opening, right, even starting. Right? So I think there can, unfortunately, be this tendency towards wishful thinking, this tendency. Um, and, and by the way, these were both great, uh, in, in some ways, uh, great philosophers. Um, one, of, one of them was uh, Louis Gompertz, uh, one of the very first animal rights advocates and, and vegans. Um, but, but uh, yeah, anyway, so these, in some ways, pretty great minds could nevertheless still make this huge mistake of mm. completely, um, overlooking the fact that things could get much worse and that in fact, humanity could create this new kind of moral catastrophe. I mean, not, not super new in kind, in the sense that it was alien beings or, or very strange beings that they wouldn't know about, but, and then again, in some sense, they actually are, right? Because the way in which we bred chickens since then is just bear no resemblance to the kinds of chickens who, who existed around 200 years ago, right? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's just, as a general matter, important not to overlook the risk that things can get much worse, as mm. unpleasant as that is to think about, and also as, in some sense, unthinkable as it is, right? When you look at the scale of, of both factory farming and wild animal suffering, but I think, it, yeah, I think it is an instructive, instructive lesson to look at how people in the past, unfortunately, have <clears throat> seem to have had a pretty huge blind spot in, in this regard. And so, yeah, for that very reason, um, yeah, I think it teaches us to, to not make the same mistake, right? It, at the very least, it gives us some pause to reflect on whether we might be making a, a similar mistake if we completely dismiss, maybe wishfully, um, optimistically, dismiss this notion of, of artificial sentience. Mm. So I had um, some, I had sort of uh, two questions on the effective altruism community, because I know 
um i know you sort of i don't know if you consider yourself part of the community but i know you've you know you've definitely interacted with the community and men members of it um and made contributions um and the first thing that i wanted to ask is um you have written about how you've been disappointed with the reception of or reaction to suffering focused ethics in effective altruism spaces uh, i wanted to ask if suffering focused ethics or at least more of a priority put towards um that way of viewing ethics was adopted uh you know in a widespread way by the ea community how do you think if it would at all how do you think that would change their priorities and their cause areas <clears throat> yeah i mean i think it would change things a lot um and I think there's a lot that one could say about this, but I mean, to just try to be very brief. Um, yeah, they would focus, generally they would focus less on preventing extinction, which is a very big focus right now um, in the EA movement. Um, I mean, yeah, as far as I can tell, it's almost the exclusive focus for a great number of people in, in that movement. And yeah, and instead they would focus more on preventing both, you know, existing forms of extreme suffering and extreme violence that's that's taking place right now. Um, and in addition, not least, they would give a lot of uh, attention and priority to the prevention of, of worst case outcomes, right? To mm -hmm. try to avoid, yeah, these, as they've been called, S risks, right? So risks of astronomical future suffering, but also just it doesn't even have to, you know, like maybe that's that's worth clarifying that the case for focusing on worst case futures is not even predicated on the um, on, on space colonization, although that, of course, can strengthen the case greatly. But but also just on Earth, unfortunately, there is the potential for things to to get uh, even worse, even in the absence of, yeah, uh, space colonization, such as due to like uh, some of the technologies we discovered, like the risks of mm. creating those. Mm. So I know we're kind of coming towards the end. So I've got one more quick question on, on EA, um, and then maybe we can sort of move on to the final um, question. So um, you've already kind of referenced it, actually. So one of the sort of uh, big topics in the effective altruism space is the idea of long-termism. You know, it's it's particularly become popularized since the release of Will McCaskill's um, book, which um, I think it was released within the past year anyway. I, sometimes time passes me by. But um, are you able to give a quick um, explanation to the audience as to what long-termism is and just a brief overview of what your agreements and disagreements with it are? <clears throat> yeah, so with respect to long-termism, I guess... I think it's worth saying that in some ways it can be maybe a somewhat deceptive term, at mm. least in the way it's come to be used, right? So because there is a very minimal definition of what long-termism is, which basically says that um, that we shouldn't discount or at least not heavily discount the interests of future beings. Um, so if a being is suffering, it doesn't matter whether it's suffering the being is suffering right now or a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now or a million years from now we should still treat that suffering or care equally about that suffering regardless or at least roughly equally um so that's a very minimal definition of long-termism and one can have an, an asymmetric view or pessimistic view of in in population ethics or with, with respect to 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 um, procreation and then still agree with this minimal version of long-termism. But then, of course, where it gets a bit maybe deceptive is that the minimal version is not how it's typically used, like especially in the in the EA community or the, the perhaps the, um, what can I say, like in, in the, yeah, in the long-termist part of effective altruism, it, it is usually... Um, it combines the sort of minimal version of care about beings everywhere with with an additional 
more optimistic view of, of population ethics that would say that, for example, pleasure can outweigh pain or other goods can outweigh pain and, and, and it can be worth creating new happy lives, even if there are other miserable lives. Um, so as long as there are enough happy lives, then that, that can make up for it if, if they're sufficiently happy at least. And, and so that's the kind of view that obviously a lot of people, including myself, take issue with and argue can be potentially even dangerous. In fact, um, philosopher Karl Popper, he actually already wrote about the, the dangers of, of this kind of view, which can, or at least he, he wrote specifically about utopianism and how wanting this kind of being motivated to create a far future utopia could justify virtually any means, right? Including a lot of suffering, um, mm. which is something that I think, well, unfairly, people often overlook the fact that that's not true of negative utilitarianism in the sense that it wouldn't justify, you know, any suffering in order to reach some kind of um, supposedly happy state that outweighs the suffering, which I think is is, is a great strength um, and, and a strong point in favor of mm. negative utilitarianism, not having those kinds of, um, yeah, like harm increasing trade-offs. But anyway, so that's that's how long-termism has um, come to be used. And when you read, for example, in, in various places, critiques have been made of long-termism, that's usually not this kind of minimal version of long-termism, but rather the, you could call it an optim the optimistic version of long-termism. That's, that's, that's often been critiqued, and I think rightly so. Mm. So I had... Uh one more question but before i asked it i wanted to ask you if there were any other topics or points that you you wanted to convey to the audience that we maybe haven't touched on in any of my questions right so i guess one last little sort of tiny thing that occurred to me was that when i i talked about a focus on worst case outcomes or at mm. least including that kind of focus um and maybe even focusing more on that than the best case outcomes. Um, yeah, I think perhaps um, a natural question one could have it might be that, well, wouldn't antinatalism, wouldn't advocating for antinatalism also be the best way to prevent worst case outcomes and to reduce risks of those occurring? And I think that that's, that's certainly, um, is not unthinkable that it could be helpful but I think at the very least, I think there are some reasons to be skeptical. Um, so first of all, you could just say that, again, like there are so many different potential actions and priorities, right? You could take to try to, to prevent um, very bad outcomes. Mm. And so in fact, for like any particular one that you might raise as being the optimal one, yeah, just, just given the fact that this is such a big, uh, broad space, there is some reason to be to be skeptical um, that 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 should happen to be the, the very best thing. Um, and then, I or additionally, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it can maybe also be helpful to sort of frame it in terms of like, I think it can be a core component of one's approach, right, and especially like defending views that give strong importance to the prevention of suffering, right? Um, one could say that antinatalism can be an example of that. Although, yeah, in my view, there are, there are probably views that are even more um, maybe, I suspect could, could be more convincing. Like for example, views that, or also, also arguments for antinatalism, but also views in general that emphasize extreme suffering, right? I think sometimes in the context of antinatalism, this can be referred to as, or can at least fall under the, the risk argument, right? Mm. And referred to. And in my view, I mean, so my own view is that extreme suffering in particular is of overriding importance. Um, so, so, but yeah, so even if one is focusing on moral arguments, I, I might, um, suggest that this kind of focus on extreme suffering might be overall more effective, maybe both theoretically and practically sound. Um, but then in addition, you could also say that 
moral arguments in themselves. And while I've also emphasized that as you could say um, something that I see as um, yeah important to focus on and something I believe is is helpful and valuable to do, I don't think it's exhaustive or sufficient in itself. I, I think it's it's important to also look at like concrete practical questions, right? And and frankly, there are a lot of them, right? So a specific class of issues that's highly relevant is like the issue of, of politics and what kind of policies to to institute. And that's where I think people who are trying to reduce suffering, they there's potentially a lot to gain, right? Especially because a lot of people do actually um, do think that it's important to reduce you to suffering. I've also written a post about um, that if you just simply look at what lay people's views are in population ethics, they're actually, it, it seems overall, like, of course, it, it, this argument, it doesn't involve some extrapolation, but it does seem like um, generally people seem to think that it's much, much more important to avoid, to avoid outcomes with a lot of suffering than to create a very large uh, utopia, right? As mm. is the focus of many people in the effective altruism movement. So there is at least potentially, there are some reasons to think that you could actually maybe tap into a large consensus there and gain support for yeah, policies that perhaps make humanity more resilient to like such that we can avoid worst case outcomes, right? To specifically make us, um, to yeah, make those less likely, which I suspect also, um, yeah, that, that's another thing. That's another potential like practical reason in favor of focusing on the avoidance of worst case outcomes is that it would actually, it's, it's, there's the strange situation where it's at the same time very neglected, mm -hmm. but it seems like potentially you could actually gain a lot of support for it if you manage to sort of tap into this reservoir of dormant support. Mm. Yeah. So we're uh, coming to the end of time. So I've got one last question, um, which uh, if you can uh, give a brief answer on. So I very quickly wanted to ask, um, the people watching will presumably be, uh, you know, a group of people who are, you know, who want to reduce suffering in the world, who care about making the world a better place. What can they do as individuals to propagate suffering focused ethics? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so, one slightly maybe disappointingly boring answer is that I think it's very helpful to to read about these issues. Um, and to read about them from like a variety of authors. So I think in fact, um, yeah, it, it can be helpful to gain, to become familiar with, um, yeah, in fact, I, would, I think I would encourage reading both like on the theoretical level and the practical level, uh, mm -hmm. because both can matter. And like the kind of, which view one adopts at the theoretical level can ultimately matter a lot for what you do in practice, right? Mm. So for example, if if you do think that extreme suffering is the overriding priority, that can come to matter, at least in some respects, it can come to matter a lot um, when it comes to what, what you try to do in practice. So, so yeah, I mean, of course it's maybe, it's probably extremely self-serving that I say that as someone who writes books about these issues, but uh, but to be honest, the, most of the writing that's out there is not by me, obviously. Um, so, and of course, I, there, it also there can also be important differences, right, in terms of whether one is aiming to to specialize, um, trying to advance or further advance suffering focused ethics um, with with like original work, or whether one is trying to do advocacy. I mean, I think it's helpful to be quite to be highly informed in both mm. cases. But uh, of course, if if one is primarily focusing on, uh, yeah, the more practical side, yeah, then I would say still, in fact, reading up on some of the stuff that's been written about, uh, yeah, the, the practical issues can, I think, be, be helpful. And as I think I mentioned earlier, my colleague's book, uh, 
avoiding the worst, how to prevent a moral catastrophe. I think that's a pretty good place to start as an introduction, also mm. on, on the practical issues. Cool. Well, we're sending out a newsletter after this, probably tomorrow morning, or, you know, tomorrow morning for, for me anyway. Um, so I'll include a link to that directly, the um, the YouTube audio version. Um, but yeah, th thank you so much for joining Magnus um, and to round off, you know, the last session of the uh, of the first conference. So thank you so much for joining us and um, answering all the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It was uh, I, I enjoyed joining you.